Hello, everybody. <laughs> Let's see, is there anybody actually here? No, there's not. Yeah, well, that's no surprise, giving half an hour no notice to anybody. So just going to hang out and maybe do some talking, and uh, we'll see if anybody shows up. I kind of like this format. I'm thinking maybe of just switching to live streaming all the time instead of making videos less editing and bother. Let me know what you think about that idea. So I guess I'll just get to the shield. Sorry, I was going to drink this coffee before I started and then got to running around doing other things and now I've got the coffee and I'm slurping but So, second. Da, da, da. So, remember I was glued all this together and I was going to do some another test on it. And I loaned it out to Stephen, the guy from the video. Um, who was holding this thing when we cut holes in it. And uh, I loaned it to him after I made this repair right here. Took the clip, remember? The clip. Let's let everybody see the clip. Yeah, nice. And uh, I don't know, he, he, he left it in the car and it really doesn't matter because it's February in the California Bay Area, so it's not like the weather is extreme right now, but you can see the cracks just blew the heck open, right? Right there. And yeah, right there, see that? Obviously, I mean, this thing, it would continue to take a beating but it's not going to hold up for very long. And you don't want your shield just coming apart like that, obviously. But remember, I made this one out of balsa wood. Super flimsy, super crushable, super wimpy. So this shield is all about if you have matters. These channels are way too big. And I did some preliminary tests with some pieces of uh, poplar wood and you don't get these big four or five inch cuts from a sword whack in it but this thing showed us a lot and uh, the only thing really left to see was how this repair would hold up and I don't think that we're going to learn anything by testing that that we won't learn by redoing the same slightly different a slightly different experiment but with different kinds of wood so that leads me to open door the poplar shield back there which i've divided it up into several layers and i'll go over that when i do the testing this the faces has several different layering systems to each take wax to see what's better so that's going to do for that testing and I'm going to go on to make other shields out of the planks behind me in the background there. And this, I'm probably going to do a couple more repair clips too. Uh, that's the other important thing. So what we learned from leaving the shield in the car is that the temperature did lead to the glue separating and popping these cracks open. But the clip held everything together. You can kind of see that it opened up a little bit but the clip kept it from coming apart so it's still stable in there but even still this rivet brings around i don't know if you guys can see this see right there it's trying to pull through the wood and it's just because this wood is too darn soft. So it's time to, to start with new shields. 
And I knew that was going to happen. And the goal, of course, was never to make a shield out of balsa wood. The goal was to learn things about shield making. Cat's getting a little crazy here. To learn things about shield making on an experimental shield so that when I go and buy expense, more expensive wood and, you know, like horse hides and stuff like that, I don't make all of my experimenting errors on, uh, on the expensive material. Like one thing I wanted to test was the idea of this hide glue paint. And as you can see, it works, but it makes these little cracks. Now, is that due to the wood being strong? I want to use a good example. I knew, some, I, I knew a lady who made a uh, tile mosaic on a, uh, wood table and left it outdoors. And as the wood expanded and contracted from taking on moisture from the climate, the concrete, which is hard, like a frosting, you know, would crack and split and the whole thing fell apart. So we're having the same thing going on like this stuff, where this stuff, the hide glue hardens like car paint, you know, um, it's super hard. But then because the shield expands and contracts, you get all these stress fractures in it. And then eventually that leads to chipping. And it worked better with the, the rust paint than it did the blackberry because the blackberry uh, was just pure, slick, like enamel. And this had some texture and grit to it. And that keeps it from splitting as much, but as you can see, it still did. So, of course, when I started in making shields, uh, I learned that they were, quote, either made out of hide glue or casein glue. And I thought, well, which one makes more sense? Hide glue, right? Because hide glue you can make out of dead animals instead of, uh, like, hide waste products and st stuff you find on a battlefield instead of food, milk, cheese, you know. Um, and hide glue... You can dry it, carry it around with you, stuff like that. So I thought it would make sense to see if you can use hide glue. And it does work pretty good. I think that if I didn't use it as a surface material, it would be, uh, it works as a glue better than it does a paint. Let me just put it that way. Let me show you the other shield. Just show you what I mean. Okay, this is just pure hide glue on here with no uh, no paint. And let's see if we can find some light. It and this is also on poplar planks, so it's not as squishy as the uh, balsa. And you don't see the same stress fracturing in the glue that you do um, on the balsa wood shield. So it's possible that, that is redeemable, so to speak. Although we do see some. Let's see if we can get that in the light. Well, right in here, not not really, but but there's like a crack every couple inches instead of over there where you can just see it's like constant web. So it's if hide glue does work, um, it needs to be on a solid solid wood, which might be another reason why. Uh, which might be another reason. <laughs> Lost my train of thought there. Which might have been another reason why they were so particular about importing certain kinds of wood. That's what I wanted to say. So, this guy is going to get prepared and retired, I think, is, is the plan. 
this guy is. Because I think even just as it sits here and crackles in the temperature, uh, it's gonna it, it's gonna just con this is gonna keep happening, and I'm gonna have to keep reapplying and reapplying, and it's just I'd rather just start over with something new. So what am I doing from there? <sighs> so I made my 36 inch poplar over there, and that's going to be testing surfaces. Um, that one is the, going to be the last of my cloth backed shields because I've decided that cloth uses too much damn glue. And the amount of work it takes to make the glue, uh, is so extensive, is so extensive that I can't help but think that back in the day, so to speak, you would just go get another hide. Because, yeah, hides are hard to come by, but fabric is a kind of a pain in the ass to make. And then to, like, saturate it with glue takes a lot of glue. And if the glue is made out of hide anyway, you know, it, I just, I don't think that there's much sense in, in using fabrics. Maybe that's why... Um, I believe it was the Romans shields that had hell. The other thing about hide glue is that it's water soluble. And I think the casein glue would hold up better on a shield that is boat, around a boat, you know? Now I wanna talk about that because this is something that's been driving me kind of nuts about the whole discussion of Viking shields. And that's the idea that there's a, there is a Viking shield, like one kind or one way, or they made them like this. And, you know, we're talking about a weapon that, spans what I don't know a thousand year of your countries besides some other places besides you know lots and lots and lots of damn round shields all over and it's you know saying well it was this but not that I mean there's a place for that but also it's like it's like suggesting that there's only one kind of sword and that you know well, swords weren't long like that. They were only this long. And, you know, maybe there were different kinds in different places for different reasons. Like, for example, if you read... Oh, I hope I'm not getting my authors mixed up here. If you read Hark's book on Anglo-Saxon shields, uh, they point out that the biggest Anglo-Saxon shield is basically one that was probably meant to not be an Anglo-Saxon shield. That's the Sutton Hoo shield at 36 inches in diameter, which is basically very similar to a Valsgard shield um, and is like the only Anglo-Saxon shield like that and all of this other stuff. But mainland Europe, the average shield size was much larger. Now, people are people, and cutting people to bits is cutting people to bits. It's not like the British soil, so what's that about? You know, was it trees are harder to find, so they tended to make smaller planks? Was it that the British fought more in a certain kind of way. I, I, I don't know. Out to a boat and the rim is rawhide and is meant to keep the planks together. You're going to have this problem where it's constantly trying to re-moisturize and loosen. And then once that happens, the planks will start to bend you know, according to their own 
uh, grain instead of being held together by that tight rawhide. I mean, I don't know if you're familiar with being by the coast, but it is hard on boats. Old plank boats are, are a constant maintenance. I mean, just constantly painting and repainting and cleaning and recleaning and, you know, so one thing I've been wondering is maybe, maybe full metal rim shields are a solution to that. So I've been looking between met, the metal rim shields, which are very few full rim metal. And uh, maybe, maybe that is um, correlated with uh, boat burials. It's true in the Sutton Hoo case. The Sutton Hoo case is, I believe, the only metal rimmed shield found in Britain from the era, and it is a boat burial. The Valsgard graves, I believe, are another metal rimmed shield burial and boat burial. Uh, I, of course, don't have all of the body of evidence at my fingertips, but I don't think I've found a full metal rim shield with boat burial. And a full metal rim shield would make sense in a maritime situation and see, here's the thing. The Romans had metal rim shields and they stopped using them because, and I've only read this secondhand. I haven't had it confirmed because they were too hard to repair and maintain. A sword hits it, the little metal clips go flying everywhere and, and that's it. Where it cuts off, et cetera, et cetera. So the point is that the people of the era, it's likely they knew about metal rim shields. You know, somebody probably found a grave find at some point, and yet they didn't use them because it's a big pain in the butt to make them, and they're inferior. They're not inferior if leather doesn't work, which would, might be the case in a maritime situation. So that's something I've been thinking about. So I suspect that there were different shields for different purposes, that they were made in different ways, and that context matters. For instance, the uh, Osberg ship. No handles for all of those shields, which is statistically unlikely, even though if I recall the dig is from the 1800s when they were kind of sloppy, they found one shield handle piece and it looks like a very fancy one. It's not the kind that you would see 30 freaking ship burial, even a fancy ship burial like that. So to my mind, they weren't carried. Maybe those shields were permanently fixed to the side of the boat because it was something good to hide behind so you didn't get shot from a shore. We've learned from uh, the people that do what's called the Eastern fighting style. Uh, plank shields don't hold up as well as plywood ones, of course, to their style of fighting. So maybe those shields were designed thicker than, say, dueling because maybe you wanted a 10 pound shield for fighting in a shield wall well, but if you were you know doing home gang let's say you might want a six pound shield because maneuverability and deflection is a lot more important than just being able to take a smashing you know i don't know because you don't have to worry about being flanked as much in the shield wall it's more of an endurance beating kind of thing It could be that if you knew you were going to war, 
weeks in advance, let's say, you made your shield with casein glue because it was superior in that it uh, was water soluble and stayed hard, you know. Uh, but if you uh, broke your shield, if you were raiding a foreign country, let's say, and your shield got lost at sea or destroyed on the first landing, you made your shield, a new, your next shield out of hide glue because hide glue is what you need cheese lying around to make your next shield up, you know so how it's done like you know you take the uh, the case in blue recipe and you'll hear people say well it was done this way and there's this sort of implication that doing it some other way is therefore wrong or wasn't done or it's like, no, what we know is that one guy in the 1400s had the opinion that you could make a shield this way. That doesn't say anything else about how anyone else made it or anything. Or what happened 500 years prior, uh, 5,000 miles, 2,000 miles away. It's, you know, there's... This is something that has been, uh, it's just the way people talk about things and the assumptions that are made, you know. Um, well, you know, there were three shields in the home gang because the shields were expected to be destroyed or whatever. Well, maybe that's why. And then, therefore, all all shields were meant, weren't meant to be fixable. Like, well, no, maybe it's they didn't want to stop the duel and repair one shield in the middle of the duel. That's like, here, we'll bring three shields. If somebody's breaks, they get a second one. And if that somehow breaks, they get a third one. And then if that breaks, they're on their own because that's just ridiculous. And then we can repair them all at night. But shields are supposed to be repairable, but it takes overnight. We're trying to have a duel, and we don't have time for that. You know, so it's just we've got to think more about why we believe what we believe and not pen ourselves in. Maybe there were four different designs for Viking Shield. Maybe all of the ones that were buried were designed, had things done to them that you would only do to ones that were buried. The ones that we found in bogs have some unique characteristics relative to some burials you know something to think about there well let me show you where i'm going in the future here and then i think this has gone on long enough and i'm going to wrap it up for now i guess i've just had a lot of things to say so let me just we're going to move this Okay, so this is my second set of poplar planks. After I'm finished doing the testing on that guy there, you know, apply that knowledge, and I might make this one double skinned in the front because I got a lot of goat skins. They came in a hen pack, and now I have way more than I need. So might as well use them up. And this stuff is kind of thin. I don't know if too late. There aren't. There isn't much evidence to suggest that the Vikings or anybody, uh, except the Romans, I believe, uh, used multiple layers of hides. I think that there was. There's a few finds, so it's it's one of those things where it happened, but it didn't happen a lot. Probably anybody that wanted it thicker just went and got a dip thicker animal hide instead of two thinner ones. Anyway. So I'll, I'll make this one. It'll have three hides total, and one in the back, two in the front, probably, with all with casein glue, I think is what I'll be doing there. And then I'm going to do a more typical uh, rim, like the kind you see everyone else make, because I've tried the thicker ones, and... Um, 
well, I think I've learned that that's useful for a training weapon. I don't think it's particularly useful for actually like stopping weapons. I think I think the type of wood plays a more significant role than layers of leather. Although, in further experiments, I plan on getting to trying like hard boiling leather and various tricks to make the leather rim harder. Because I think there might be something to that too. We'll see how that goes. Um, I do have a couple. Let me find out. I'll find something here. So, one thing I read is that ash planks, they imported ash planks instead of using local trees, which were also used for shields. Let me just look something up. Hmm. Hmm. I can't find this. All right. Well, I am going to have to call it for right now. But I just wanted to show you actually a couple of things. I wanted to get some vital stats so that I was uh, not just making up numbers, but I can't seem to find them. Um, I have also, so I have three more shields to make. And then I think we're gonna be calling it for this shield making insanity unless somebody wants me to make them one. Um, because I do want to use up my supplies, and I think I will have learned what I need to learn. Anyway, so I did get some ash planks. Very impressive wood. It's definitely, you can feel it's hard. I don't know, it's just got like a density to it. And, you know, Definitely, I can see why this is going to be sticky, not grabby. Sword will stick in and pull out. I can see it. I could even see bending a blade in this, really. So, ash planks. I'll make a 36 out of that. And these. Oh, I, I wanted to just announce after I got the shield made, but I don't think I'm going to... It's going to be a while before I get to that. These are not basswood. What do I mean by that? I have been going crazy on the word Lind for months now. And I mean, I have written uh, Proto-Indo-European experts at UT. I've talked to Jackson Crawford's staff. I've uh, talked to the people who at the Sutton Who Museum. I've gone to Stanford to hand copy the entire uh, Sutton Who Arms and Armor book, this like super rare book that is impossible to find freaking anywhere because I learned something about Lynn. It's a poem and I like to compare 
to rap music, which I'm sure just triggered the crap out of half of everybody that listened to this, but hear me out. Okay. So in rap music, and this is one of my, my favorite examples, there's a, uh, Snoop Dogg has a song where he calls his gun a fajita. And in the context of listening to the song, you know that he means a gun, even though he used the word fajita. Why did he use the word fajita? Because it sounds cool and because it rhymes with nine millimeter. Nine millimeter fajita. You see? But in the context, you know what that means. Let me give you another example. Let's say that you have a cold and you ask me for a Kleenex and I look around and all I see is a box of tissues on the table. Now I know that you want a tissue and that you don't mean that I should leave the house and go find a box of Kleenex. So in the same way, perhaps the words that they use in Beowulf are not actually meant to be taken literally, but they're symbolic and they work with uh, the poem because Beowulf is done according to rules of the poetic style and it needs to fit those. And the words also, you know, there's half a dozen words for shield and which one was used um, is decided by it fitting into the poem. And this is the amazing thing about Beowulf. It fits poetically, but the word that is used is chosen out of all of them to point to specific aspects of the thing in question, like the shield. And uh, highlight them. So you take the word, take uh, a fighting man, you know. You might call him a warrior, a soldier, a uh, mercenary, a man-at-arms, a knight. I don't know if I said warrior already. You know, all of these different things. And you pick which of those you want to use to describe the same guy to draw attention to different, um, you know, to highlight different aspects of that, that thing. So the shield and the words for it are no different. There are some words for shield that are meant to highlight uh, their beauty and craftsmanship. And there are some that are meant to draw attention to the nimble dexterity of the warrior. And there are some that are meant to illustrate how hard and tough, you know, strong they are. So... The word lind gets used to describe a shield in Beowulf in contexts where a word connotating litheness would be appropriate and not when the author wants to point out a shield's strength, toughness, endurance, you know, like heavy, thick, strong characteristics. So if you look at the etymology of the word lind, it comes from a word meaning lithe and flexible. So here's an interesting question is, you know, did that word start out an adjective and then become a noun for a particular type of tree? In other words, did the tree borrow the word from the shield instead of the shield being named after the tree. Because, you know, the hard shield that's made of metal in Beowulf is not described as a lin. People that, you know, study and reconstruct Proto-Indo-European. And the answer I've been getting is yes. Yes, it could be. 
And the reason why this is important is because it might mean that when they're using the word Lind, they don't really mean that that shield is actually made out of linden wood. See, linden, as in lind-like, meaning perhaps that the word lind means pointing to its deflective, lithe, quickly movable nature, right? Then the tree, which also exemplifies those characteristics, gets named after that. Anyway, the ultimate answer that I've gotten from the linguistics experts on this matter is it's hard to know for sure. You can't really tell, but that what I believe makes sense etymologically, and it's possible. You know, we're reconstructing dead languages here, so there isn't a definitive authority to ever compare it to. You can't go back and ask them. So sometimes the best you can follow, sometimes the end of the rabbit trail is a maybe. But I've come to think that perhaps my theory is incorrect because I've also studied literature about the shields that are thought to be made of lime wood. And, you know, thought to is vague. You know, what does it mean? Someone just looks at something, eyeballs it, and says, I guess. And it, in fact, turns out that there are very, there are laboratory procedures and that it's a process of elimination and comparison and that sort of thing. So it's probably the case that some shields did get made out of lime wood, but then if you look at the Sutton Hoo burial, and my gosh, I'm this is going to be a long talk, so I hope you're finding this fascinating. Uh, if you look at the Sutton Hoo burial, it's kind of suggests that the king that was buried there was a Beowulf fanboy who may have made the same assumptions that we make today by reading that book or story and saying, aha, it says Lind, this tree, the shield must be made of Linden. I want a shield like Beowulf's, so make me a Linden shield. Because if you look at the burial there, it's pretty clear that I mean, the helmet plaques and all of that. There's a lot of Beowulf-themed stuff to that burial. So it kind of makes you wonder, you know, if there's not what we used to call in school the pizza effect going on, which is, I want the authentic thing, so therefore I make the thing that's authentic. The pizza effect is where you go to Italy wanting genuine Italian pizza and buy it from genuine Italians, except the thing is that they learned it from Americans who, because it's expected of them, and there's no real such thing as Italian pizza, the genuine Italian pizza. Genuine Italian pizza is really genuine New York pizza, which is based on an idea of what genuine Italian pizza should be. That's the pizza effect. So, you know, perhaps we are just suffering a multi-century pizza effect where King Ringwald, if that was who was buried in Sutton, who, Red Beowulf, just like us, red, who knows, and said, aha, see, it says Linden, that must mean the tree, let's make my shield out of the tree. Something like that. But anyway, to solve all of this, I thought, you know, the simple thing to do is to just get the wood, make the shield, and see how it holds up. And I did. Linden wood. And I've learned that linden wood, there, there's a lot of talk about how linden and bass wood are the same, American tila and European tila. And this comes from not understanding science. <laughs> I mean, 
Yeah, they they both have the same genus, Tia, but so do uh, let's see, you know, so do a lot of other things. I, I don't even want to screw up and get it wrong. Uh, so do a lot of other things that that are very that have a very different characteristics, right? You know, like everything that you learned in anthropology: Homo sapien, Homo habilis, Homo erectus, Homo sapien sapiens, Homo. That's the reason why there's all these homos. <laughs> Sorry, the reason why there's all these homos is because there's physical differences between them, right? And it's the same thing with tea trees. I mean, why would a tree that grows in Europe be the same exactly as one that grows in the US? It doesn't make any sense. So I don't have the numbers, but it turns out that European tea is different than American tea trees. Basswood is not linden wood. They're similar, but I believe it's crushability that this stuff has like, or flexibility. It's one of the two where this has double nearly what the American stuff is. And I will put those numbers down in that. Curiously, and let's just make it this, let's just make this a, a torturable hour here. So one thing I learned was that Just it here. One thing that I one thing that I have learned is that when they say probably limewood, what they mean is that they're looking at little discs of metal stained wood that, uh, you know, were up under an iron rivet against the shield. And different woods have different characteristics, right? There's the cellular structure in there. There's rays, veins, all kinds of different types of cellular structures, just like animals. So they get that sample and they look for characteristics. Like lime, I think, has a lack of ray structure. So if they don't find ray structure, then they say, okay, it's it, this is one more evidence that it might be lime. And does it match this? And it's like a process of elimination kind of thing, you know? So when they say probably lime, what it means is we've looked at the samples and it most likely is this, but it could also be this other thing or we could be wrong. So for example, let's say one of the characteristics is no rays. And you happen to take a sample of wood that has no rays. What you don't know is that your sample is just the ray-free part of the wood and that the rest of the wood has lots of rays. So in other words, your sample doesn't, your lack of rays in your sample doesn't prove that it's a certain kind of wood, it only makes it possible. Or to put it another way, finding a ray would eliminate that possibility. And then you could go, okay, lime says no rays, here's a ray, this is not lime. So that's what they mean by that. So there is no, I have not found a single contacted, the, so when they take, when they, when they dig up something like the Sutton Who Shield, they send it off to an expert in that specific, you know, all I do is look at plant samples, tree samples, wood samples, person, and then that person tells them what they think it is, and then that's what goes in the study, right? So I didn't just get the studies, I went and got the reports from the people. And it turns out actually that most of the lime wood samples from shields are determined to be maybe lime by one or two people because it all goes to this place called Kew Gardens, K-E-W, and 
there haven't been a lot of samples in the first place, and there aren't a lot of experts whose job it is to do this. So, you know, if you think that uh, bias matters, your sample size is one. You know, if it's interpretive is my point, you know, what if this person is, uh, and I mean, I'm not saying this is true. I'm sure that they know what the hell they're doing. But the point is that the whole evidence body that Lyme shields are real uh, kind of falls back on one person's maybes. And definitely falls back on, um, you know, enough wood that you can probably fit it in a tablespoon or two, you know. At least from what I've seen, it does not look like a lot of evidence. So we're kind of doing a lot of guessing, especially with the Lyme. And is it possible that this whole thing is a misunderstanding? And, and an evolution of a word and a misunderstanding of what that word means. I don't know, but I'm going to make myself a genuine European lime wood shield. I found like one guy that will make this stuff into planks in Britain and had it imported here. And, uh, oh boy, that was not cheap. So for science, um, We're going to make a shield, and then I'm going to do something crazy. All right. Uh, thanks for watching and sticking through 50 minutes of me babbling on and on and on. Please stay tuned to this channel. I'm going to finish this shield stuff, and then I'm going to France and Germany, and I'm going to roam the countryside looking for old standing stones, forgotten things, um, and all the stuff that there isn't videos of so that uh, you guys can see what it's like over there and you can catalog my adventures. Thanks for watching.